Hello, everyone. Nice to see you. I am uh, Dr. Sharon Pochran. I'm the, I'm the faculty director of Ecology and uh, Human Impact. And it's my great honor and privilege to introduce the 2017 Sustainability Studies Alumni Panel. Before we start, I'd like to invite everybody um, for cookies and more conversation back at the Sustainability Studies Suite when we're all finished here. They have a class that starts exactly at 2.30. If you'd like to um, talk to any of the panelists or the moderator or just eat cookies, just come join us in the Sustainability Suite when we're finished. Um, I'd like to start uh, today by thanking everybody who made this possible. Uh, uh, Kim Knoll and Heidi Hutner found our panelists, organized the time and space. We couldn't do this without them. Um, but I'd also like to thank Ginny Clancy. She was the um, person who organized this all of the previous years. I don't know whether this is our sixth or seventh, but um, alumni panel. It's always been very well attended, um, generating a lot of conversation about our field. And um, she gave us this great template that we're using today. Um, so even though she's not here, thank you, Ginny. Uh, I'd also like to thank our moderator and introduce our moderator, um, Michael White Esquire. He is a practicing attorney. He concentrates his law practice in areas of environmental law, land use litigation, natural resource law, and he's also the owner and president of LI Strategies, Inc., an environmental planning consulting firm. If that's not enough, he serves as a, this is a long list. I had to write it down. There was no memorizing this. I thought about memorizing. I'm like, no, this is, I'm not going to, I'm going to mangle it if I memorize it. So bear with me. He's the member of the Long Island Regional Planning Council, the chair of the Board of Governors of the New York Sea Grant. He serves on the Long Island Commission of Aquifer Protection, is chair of the Finance Committee, and is on the Management Committee for the Long Island Nitrogen Action Plan. Okay, we're still not done. Amazingly, given all of those activities, he's also adjunct faculty in SOMAS, teaching a course in environmental law and environmental management. So he actually is a great moderator for this panel because he embodies the interdisciplinary nature of sustainability. Um, okay, uh, he won all sorts of awards. I'm just gonna name some of them. He, he is the recipient of the Toro Law College Center Pro Bono Attorney of the Year the old Westbury College Foundation Theodore Roosevelt Preservation Award. With his wife, he is an honoree for the Cornell Cooperative Extension, and he was named the Environmentalist of the Year by Stony Brook University's Earth Stock Program. So we're lucky to have him. Okay, so the academic field of sustainability studies is unique because it focuses on, I'm gonna say this again, so sustainability studies is an academic field is unique because it focuses on human-made problems. Its faculty and staff are unique because they use teaching approaches and researches, research approaches that are problem-solving based. We, we teach about solving problems. Our students and alums are unique because they carry four unusual skill sets that they learned here and they carry them into the workplace and into the world, making the world a better place. I wanna take a moment to describe those four amazing skill sets. First, our graduates are skilled in systems thinking. And I know that sounds jargony, so I'm going to explain what that means exactly. They analyze the inner workings of unrelated domains and put them together in unique ways. So that means somebody can learn about medicine and policy and put it together for public health. Somebody can learn about environment and policy and put that together for city planning. This is not a skill you learn in biology or government. This is something you learn in sustainability studies. The second skill that our, our students learn are, is this um, idea of value-focused thinking. And what that means is our students can't know how to identify current cultural values. They know how to assess those values and advocate for change if necessary. They know how to advocate for change after identifying um, cultural values. That's a pretty important thing. This allows them to unite disparate stakeholders and a united, give them a united cause, even if they're coming from really different places and have different kinds of skin in the game. Third, our graduates are skilled at strategic thinking. They know how to design and implement interventions, enabling transitions towards more sustainable futures. 
So they come up with plans, they design plans, they implement plans. It's not just theoretical. And then lastly, our, our graduates, and, and actually I think this is one of the things I'm most proud of, they're really, really skilled at collaboration. They know how to facilitate cooperation across communities, across cultures, across social systems, and um, to do that, they have to wear their anthropology hats, learn how to put judgment aside and see the world from somebody else's point of view. That's a pretty important skill. So I'd like to quickly introduce our six panelists who've mastered these skills and brought them into the workplace, making the world a better place. Okay, you guys sat in random orders. Okay, so Shamika Hansen is first. She graduated in 2015 with an environmental humanities degree. Emily Markowitz graduated in 2016 with a degree in marine sciences and she had three minors, geospatial sciences, coastal uh, environmental sciences, and theater arts. Oh, you guys did sit in the right order. My family graduated in 2015 with a degree in ecosystems and human impact, which means she's my baby, and a minor in sustainability studies. I'm so proud of her. Sean Nuzo graduated in 2013 with a degree in environmental design, policy, and planning. Liam Trotta, Trotta graduated in 2013 with a degree in environmental design, policy, and planning. And Erica Serino graduated in 2014 with a degree in environmental studies and a minor in environmental humanities. With that, I'm going to hand the floor over to our moderator, Michael White. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm really uh, pleased and, and proud uh, to be able to do this today. Uh, as you can see from my background, uh, this interdisciplinary approach and what the sustainability studies program represents is something I truly believe in. And hopefully everyone here on the panel is going to relay to you uh, how important their education was into uh, what they're doing. Um, so first, I would like to uh, uh, acknowledge and recognize their, their achievements and we're going to have a chance to hear from them a little while about themselves. And uh, before we begin, I want to thank you up front for coming here today and, of course, thank the panelists uh, for being here uh, to participate. So the first thing we're going to do, and we don't have a lot of time, uh, so I'm going to ask you to be succinct but give your input as best you can. Um, I'm going to give each of the panelists a chance, sort of in their own words, to introduce themselves about what they do, uh, briefly about themselves, not their whole background, um, and then um, a little bit about uh, why this program was so important to them in terms of bringing them to where they are. So um, let's start over here. We have a microphone. Erica, I think you turn it on at the bottom. Yeah, use this one. We joked about my sitting on the end and getting either the first one or the last last spot. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, as you guys were introduced, I am Shamika Hansen, a 2015 graduate um, of the Environmental Humanities Program, although I started off in the Sustainability Studies uh, Program. Um, and just quickly, I work currently for an organization uh, called Mothers Out Front. We work with mothers, grandmothers, and caregivers to engage elected officials and local decision makers to act aggressively on climate change by transitioning from fossil fuels to renewable energy um, in as quickly and justly of a manner as possible. Um, pr prior to this, I worked at uh, another organization called Clearwater up in the Hudson Valley. It was started by Pete Seeger. For those of you who don't know it, um, you may know it from the festival up there. And um, right now in my position, I am a community organizer on Long Island. And uh, what that just means is I engage with local residents who want to volunteer with us and basically learn how to tell their stories and become leaders in their communities um, and do my job. Uh, I'm, I'm working myself out of a position, hopefully. Hi everyone, my name is Emily Markowitz. I'm a graduate, oh, so I graduated in 2016 um, in the marine sciences uh, major and the three minors. Um, and so I'm a graduate student now at, at SOMAS, at the School of Marine Atmospheric Sciences, working with Janet and I, and I'm looking at 
fish population distributional shifts. So fish, fish populations are moving northeastward following temperature and several other factors and trying to quantify that and predict that for informing fisheries management. Um, my minors in GIS and uh, coastal environmental sciences were in, so informative to that because GIS gave me the skills to understand how to deal with data and to database that data. Um, that has clearly been incredibly useful. My entire master's is on the computer. Uh, I do love field work, so I really miss it. <laughs> but, uh, and then coastal environmental, uh, coast, yeah, coastal environmental sciences was instrumental in understanding the management aspect of that. Uh, there, I took a class with Michael Spraza where we just talked about how policy is formed in different countries and that was really helpful for everything that I'm doing now. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Mai and just as a reminder, I was, um, my degree is in ecosystems and human impact. Uh, currently, I am pursuing my master's degree at Fordham University at the Biological Sciences Department. And I, with a concentration, my master's is uh, focused in ecology and evolution. Currently, I am collaborating with uh, collaborators and um, curators, sorry, at the American Museum of Natural History for my research, which involves using leeches to help determine the um, composition of forests in terms of biodiversity and species richness. So this is a, an interesting technique that's recently been developed that I'm trying to push the boundaries of. Hi, uh, I'm Sean Nuzzo. Uh, I graduated in 2013 uh, with a degree in environmental design, policy, and planning. I'm a lead AP, and uh, shortly after uh, graduation, I founded uh, Ecological Engineering of Long Island, which is an engineering firm uh, specializing in uh, consult uh, sustainability consulting, renewable energy development, and smart growth planning. Uh, we do a bunch of other, um, I have a background in engineering, so uh, we do a bunch of other types of uh, traditional structural engineering uh, and, and architecture type stuff. Um, I didn't want to continue on too much with the engineering after taking a class with Michael White. Uh, I was like, I want to do what he does, and so that's why I'm here today. <laughs> Hello, my name is Liam Trotta. I graduated with Sean 2013 in environmental design, planning, and policy. Uh, I'm also enrolled in the graduate certificate program here at Stony Brook for geospatial science. I work full time as a planner in the town of Smithtown Planning Department, where I review permit applications for site plans for commercial properties, uh, coastal consistency with the local waterfront revitalization program, and zone changes and special exception uses. Um, <clears throat> in addition to that, I uh, perform basic developmental studies. Um, right now, we've been studying sewers for downtowns in Kings Park and Smithtown. Uh, recently did a vacancy study for Lake Avenue in St. James and downtown uh, Smithtown as well. Um, but it was the classes I took with Professor Finn, yourself, and the planning and regulations and policies, uh, and multiple other planning courses here that really got me interested in uh, in land use and general <clears throat> suburban and uh, city planning, which had me interested in applying for the position in the planning department, and it all turned out well. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Erica Serino. I graduated with my environmental studies degree in 2014 and a minor in environmental humanities. It was a class with Dr. Hutner that inspired me to kind of keep going with the more humanities-based side of um, science. With all that science background, I like to balance it with more arts. Um, so I went and got my master's in journalism here at Stony Brook in their science journalism program. And I graduated in December 2015. So this past December has been my one year anniversary of being a full-time freelance science writer and artist. I write stories for Scientific American, National Geographic, Vice, uh, Nautilus Magazine, and other uh, popular publications. Um, I like, basically I go on adventures and then I write about them. 
Um, <laughs> I document them in photographs and I also create uh, multimedia art. Um, so it's really an exciting job, especially for someone who's really bad at sitting still. Um, I believe my um, graduate advisor, Richard Firstman, at my graduation um, introduced me as the wild child that will never stay on the grid, and he was so right. So um, I have to credit Dr. Hutner and other sustainability studies professors with really inspiring my choice of career. Thank you. Thank you. I really like the part about going on adventures and writing about them. I think that's a great career. Um, so uh, just so you know, we're going to have plenty of time um, after the panel gets a chance to speak uh, and answer a couple of questions from me for you to participate by asking some questions uh, that I think uh, they can be very helpful in answering in terms of where you're going or, or where you want to be. The first thing I would say is that after listening to the panel, I think it's important to capture the fact that as was said early in the introduction of the program, the interdisciplinary nature of this program and um, really what the needs of the world are with respect to environmental management and sustainability. And what you could see already, and we're going to hear more from the panelists, is sort of taking some really basic foundation, science, application, implementation, um, and, and, and sort of that's the epitome of this inter interdisciplinary uh, performance. Um, so I want to go back to the panel now and sort of address a question, and again, listening to about them and what they do, there were some key choices that they made in terms of shifting from the undergraduate graduation into the world, and clearly none of them are finished. Uh, there's plenty of uh, time ahead of them. Um, so I'm going to uh, give a chance for each one of the panelists to talk about um, their choices, their decisions on launching into the world after being an undergraduate and graduating from college, what to do, and uh, some ideas on how they made those decisions, and again, understanding that no one's done. You have plenty of time in front of you. So um, I'm going to start with you, Sean. Um, as you said, uh, you were a student of mine and a great student in the class. And what's key to me, and I want you to talk about is, so you've chosen to sort of uh, launch right out into a presence in the community. And so talk a little bit about how uh, you started that and how that decision was made. So um, I was, I guess, what you would call a non-traditional student, whereas I already was working. I was a little older than uh, my classmates. Not by much, though. <laughs> um, and um, I was working at an engineering firm. I knew it wasn't exactly what I wanted to do forever. I wanted to always, I was always an environmentalist at heart. And so I wanted to uh, exact a meaningful change. Um, the reason why I wound up, there's two different things. So there's my work life and the community life. So the work life, which is probably more uh, relevant to what you're interested in, um, I decided to hang out my own shingle and start my own engineering firm. Um, I didn't want to become a cog, like lost uh, in a big wheel somewhere in a big company. I didn't feel like I had the experience yet. It's very, if that's the path you take, it's uh, treacherous, treacherous. Uh, and it's really difficult to do without a safety net. Um, but I wouldn't have done it any differently than, than that. Um, so the other part is the community stuff. And so I wound up, after my graduation, I became the president of my civic association, which is right here uh, in Stony Brook. So it's the Three Village Civic Association. And I had one goal in mind, and that was to um, try to bring about uh, smart growth developments along the 25A corridor in Stony Brook. Uh, so if you know the area by the train station uh, with the bench and uh, the noodle house and a couple other little places, there's really not much there. There's no, like they say, there's no there there. Um, I just always felt that wouldn't it be nice to have like a main street, an old fashioned type of walkable main street next to a campus that has 20,000 people on it at any given moment and a place for people to go, and not only just for people on the campus, but also people who live nearby. And so it was a real um, hot potato because a few years back, we had a town supervisor who also had the same idea. His name is Mark Lesko, but he came out with a, um, a, a faux pas uh, saying that we're going to develop a college town here. 
which and people who lived in the community were like, no one talked to this about this. There was no community uh, involvement. Uh, and no, they came out with their pitchforks. And we don't, you know, whatever's there is better than whatever you're going to put there. And so it went away. My idea was to revive that idea. And we had to do, we had to do it very carefully. And so after graduation, I wound up speaking with uh, Professor Finn and uh, Mark Fassanella, who was a professor here at the time. And they had their classes develop um, visions for what this area by the train station could look like. You know, what, what works, what doesn't work. And in lieu of having a final exam, they wound up presenting to the, um, to the uh, community, which, you know, I was, didn't know how it was going to turn out. Are these people, all these old people going to chase them out of the room? Or are they going to be receptive? But they were polite. And we did this maybe four or five times uh, with different classes, uh, each building on the last class. And finally, the town of Brookhaven relented. And they offered to uh, have like a professional study done. So basically, they just, rather than having students do it, they kind of took people from the community, older folks, um, and had public meetings. Uh, we eventually wound up uh, hiring a professional planning firm. And it's going to be um, released today, or we're going to get the uh, view of it today. It's been like a year and a half process. But we're going to have, finally have a vision of what we would like 25A by the Stony Brook train station to look like. And so this means that in the future, uh, bulldozers aren't going to come tomorrow to start building this. But um, and we really can't compel owners to build our vision, the community's vision, but we can incentivize it. And that's really the key. And so like the economics classes that you take, um, especially in the EDP and sustainability program, I took them at the time reluctantly. They are the most important classes I probably took, you know, they're, yep, they're with miscarcity. They without it, they are, you know, things don't change because we want a better world. Things change because it's economically viable. And that's why you see things, you know, like solar panels and electric vehicles, those are going to be game changers. And not because people want to help the planet, but they're going to be game changers because it's going to be the uh, most affordable economic option. So that's one of the big things I've learned. Thank you, Sean. And uh, so one of the things I greatly respect about that is you've taken the sort of brave step of approaching the real politics of the environment. There's nothing more political uh, than land use. Um, and I lecture about politics and the environment. You can't get around it, particularly these days. Um, so we're going to go over to Erica. Shamika. I know you guys got it. I'm sorry. Shamika. <laughs> OK. Um, so Shamika, you, you've made some choices. Uh, uh, like Sean, you've also gone out into the world, uh, had some government experience, have some not-for-profit experience, and uh, it seems you're really, really uh, taking your interest and, and putting it into play. So what along the way uh, caused you to make those decisions? Why were you inspired to go in those directions? Um, so a little bit more history. Um, as was just mentioned, I've worked in government, nonprofit. Uh, I've worked. I've worked for uh, Huntington Town Hall, their sustainability department, the council department, their assessor's office. Uh, my first uh, associates was in communications, focusing on public speaking and interpersonal relationships. Um, and I started, as I said here, uh, with sustainability studies. At that time, I was also. Um, working and I had interned for uh, Legislator Spencer in Huntington. So I have kind of an extensive background um, for someone my age. So all those different decisions um, led me to where I am now and um, is propelling me to where I'm going forward. I will say that being at Stony Brook and going from the transition from sustainability studies to environmental <laughs> humanities um, gave me more of a real world sense of people, right? We said this is kind of a human made problem. And as Sean just mentioned, you know, he has a vision, he wants to get some really good stuff done, but the community pushes back, right? So if the community isn't educated and if they don't have a stake in the decision making process and if they were not reached out to and if they don't know these public meetings exist and there aren't organizers trying to help them get there, they come out with picket fence, pickets, and you know they they they're really upset, and things don't get done. 
And what happens a lot of times, you hear that some budget passed and the money wasn't spent, or there was a grant that we got and the money wasn't spent. And a lot of times it's because the people who want to make really good decisions, um, like Sean, can't because the community kind of pushes back. So really where I am now is to ensure that those really good decisions that we want to make and the decision makers that are here that can make them for us, they have a line of communication with the people in the community and vice versa. Um, I'm hoping to eventually use this, these degrees um, and my assessor's background, uh, maybe move forward and helping property owners uh, get their uh, frontline, um, frontline communities get their uh, oceanfront properties sold to um, entities that will actually pay fair prices and then protect that coastal area. Um, so there's a lot you can do with these degrees and what I've learned is it's a really new field so we're all kind of just making it up as we go along and really everyone's interests can do something for this background. We're all in different, um, you know, positions now and, and they all really speak to each other and speak to where we live um, and that's really why I'm, I'm doing what I do now. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to go to Erica. Okay. okay. Sorry about that. Okay, thank you. But that was good. It was perfect. Thank you. So, um, so what I want to ask you though, so here's, a, here's kind of like a, a change, right? Okay. So one of the things undergraduates have to decide right off the bat is, are they going to go out of the world, maybe go some educational or certificate program later, but you kind of made the decision that you really wanted to extend the education right off before you launched into the world. So. What went into that decision making as a benefit? Right. So uh, initially, my plan was to move away as soon as possible after finishing college, as probably most of your plans are or were. Um, but then Heidi Hutner had the opportunity for me to TA as a graduate student. And um, I found the Master of Science Journalism program here at Stony Brook, and it just seemed like the right fit for the next step in my career. I wasn't sure at that point whether or not I was going to be a freelancer or not, but I knew that I wanted to definitely work in kind of um, the journalism field. So I did that and I was working um, a lot during my whole college career. Um, I started out working at a wildlife hospital at age 16 and I've been working there until I was 22 and then I started freelance writing. So it was kind of like that straight science background and then I kind of got into the straight up writing and I was studying while doing that. Um, I managed to graduate with absolutely no student debt, so <laughs> hard work pays off. Um, and oh, thank you. <laughs> this is just, I mean, um, you know, I'm I'm proud of it, but I think anyone can do it as long as you you know put your mind to it. Um, and then when it came time to decide, you know, after grad school, what to do. Um, like I said, I'm really bad at sitting still and I could never see myself in like a newsroom. Like taking my um, master's degree here, we learned, you know, what goes into being a real reporter and I was like, oh no, I'm going to hate this. Um, but then I realized that I can be a freelancer um, and that's led to many great adventures including looking for wolves in New Mexico, um, looking for orcas in the Pacific Northwest on research vessels, um, tracking birds in the Appalachian Mountains and most recently crossing the Pacific Ocean in 23 days from Los Angeles to Honolulu. Um, and I've written stories about that trip for Vice and Scientific American. And I'm currently undertaking a speaking tour about my adventure uh, on the ocean and ocean plastic, which is what I was there to study. So you can go to my website if you want to come to a talk. I'm giving one tonight in Huntington at the Cinema Arts Center. But uh, yeah, I just I plan on continuing this kind of thing. It's fun. Okay, um, now we're going to go over to Emily. Um, so clearly, um, as people have gotten some information on in the introduction and then when you spoke about yourself, a very significant undergraduate involvement and undergraduate work, uh, now at SOMAS in the Accelerated Masters Program, and some, some really good background and some real science, but some policy connected to that. But clearly you're on a path of furthering that science education. So what's, what's going into that for you? into that decision-making process? Um, so I think I should start off with all the other things I did in my undergraduate as well. Besides my, my degrees, 
I was also very, very involved with the community. I was the president of the Marine Science Club, something I'm very proud of. I think I made big strides with that and was able to get students connected with departments and professors and labs that they were interested with. And I was also very involved with labs. So my going into my master's program was very much a function of the fact that I was working with a professor that I had really liked and I wanted to do more work with. And I had the opportunity to work in other labs as well. I worked in passive acoustics lab, I worked in a coastal ecology lab, and when I was working in the fisheries ecology lab with Janet and I, I was like, this is really interesting, this has global impacts, this really connects with some of the work I'm doing in my, you know, with my minors and my major, um, and I really want to learn more about working with data. I saw from other graduate students the things that they wish that they had had when they you know, to like a skill sets that they wish they had had going into their graduate careers. And I was like, well, so that's a clear indication that that's what I should work for. So I made sure that besides working in labs, I was also trying to fill in the gaps that they saw in themselves. Um, oh, in their degrees, rather. So I took a lot of coding classes. That's what inspired me to take the GIS for a minor. Um, learn about data management, which I can't stress it enough. Take a coding class take it. <laughs> if you're thinking about it, you're like, eh, I don't know, it sounds like a lot of work, just, just do it, please. It will pay off, multifold. Um, and working in Janet's lab, I really saw how this was going to, the research goes places. She's got the connections to NOAA, to the EPA, to DC, to different groups, in, like different lab groups at different universities. Um, you go to conferences and she knows everyone. That's so important. And how does she know them? Because policy, coding, understanding of fish ecology and physiology. And so I built up all those skills while I was in my undergraduate because of the people that I learned from. And so um, that's, yeah, that, that's, that's, a, that's, my preparation in my undergraduate was huge to getting me to where I am now in my graduate career. Thank you. Okay, so um, sort of a similar question, but so uh, after listening about you, and I've read a little bit more, so um, you've chosen to go to a graduate program, to graduate school, really a focus on science and potential research, which I think is different than um, uh, many. Um, so what led you into that direction? So again, like Emily, I had uh, a really important undergraduate experience, um, or just overall experiences that um, I took away from my undergrad that really reinforced the notion that I would like to continue my education. Some of those being, um, or one of the m most important of those being uh, my involvement in the Earthworm Ecotoxicology Lab run by Dr. Pachran. And so that I joined, I believe in my sophomore year, and it gave me kind of my first taste of hands-on experimental design, um, data collection, data analysis, uh, presentation of results at the Eureka conference. That gave me my first taste of the full research experience. And as someone who hadn't gone in with too much research experience beforehand, I was very excited by the idea of being able to ask questions and then learning how to answer them yourself. And so with that, I decided to go to Madagascar on study abroad for the summer session, which is a heavily uh, research-based program. And that kind of introduced me to the world of field research and really reinforced what I kind of had known before going, that I really just wanted to be able to ask and answer my own questions. And being in Madagascar, you really see and feel the effects of sustainability, of conservation that we learn about in the classroom. It's going out into the field is an incredible way to apply everything that you're learning now. And I would highly recommend that all of you try your best to take advantage of the study abroad programs offered here. Um, and Madagascar being a fantastic example because you go and you meet people and you make connections that will carry you through the rest of your career. I am currently going back to Madagascar this summer to do some data collection for my master's, and I'm relying on the relationships that I formed in undergrad 
through the program, through Dr. Pachrin, um, and just through the people that I met throughout undergrad. Um, additionally, as part of the sustainability studies program, I took the um, Dr. Hoffman's uh, systems thinking class, the modeling class, um, and as Dr. Pachrin stated earlier, that is incredibly important. Um, it's a crucial skill to be able to tie together different components and observe how they work. Um, not only did I benefit from the class, but I was able to TA for the class, which also gave me some more experience in the classroom. Um, and currently I am teaching an intro bio class through my master's program, so I was able to surpass the teaching assistantship stage and go straight to just teaching a class on my own, which I couldn't have been able to do without um, the TA experience that I gained in this department. Thank you. Okay, and, uh, and Liam, so you sort of have a combination of this uh, pathway um, from your bachelor's degrees and uh, postgraduate work, you do certificate work and you do spatial uh, work. And now you're working full time on your continuing that education. Um, so that must be a kind of a difficult balance, but talk a little bit about how you made that choice and uh, how, it's, how it really is, how you're managing that. Okay. Uh, yeah, I work full time and uh, recently enrolled in the graduate certificate program for geospatial science here at Stony Brook. It's, um, it is pretty difficult to manage. Um, I have to take all online classes, which because of scheduling and the, just the small selection of classes that are available online, it's, I've been really taking one course at a time, but um, I've been managing it. I'm on my uh, fourth class right now. Uh, I did a semester-long research study last semester, but uh, it, like I said, it, it has been very difficult to manage the full-time work and uh, part-time coursework, but so far it's been going pretty well. So I'd say uh, Liam was also a student of mine, a great class, great student, and um, just on that point, so I could share a little experience from way back, I actually went to law school part-time. I was working full-time as the commissioner in the town of Huntington, environment control. So I wanted to ask you that question because it's great to see someone who's really like yourself being able to put those pieces together and just expand your education as well as working. Um, and so that kind of leads me to the next question, and we're going to um, ask the entire panel this one as well. Uh, so when we hear about what they're doing and how they've made these choices in terms of what they're doing, what I think you see is some personal vision, uh, some real sense of achievement and the, and the need for achievement, um, a career path, which also leads to, and just talking uh, about the comments from Liam, a career path uh, and concerns of earning a living or finding a job and earn, earning a living. And that's a difficult balance in the situation that Liam represented, but for everybody else, um, there's some sort of, again, that pathway of that uh, self-inspired vision, the education, a career path. So I want to give uh, everybody a chance to sort of answer this question um, about the thoughts about finding a job and earning a living. Where does that weigh against your vision and your achievement of what you just want to do? So um, freelancers are notoriously broke, as are most artists. <laughs> um, but freelancing itself is a really tough job, I would say, because it's a hustle all the time. Um, but the upside is that you have tremendous freedom in your day-to-day -day life. So I thought that that trade-off was worth the uh, maybe financial misery. Um, I ended up doing pretty well in my first year last year. I made almost $50,000, and my expeditions were entirely self-funded or funded by the uh, publications I work for. Um, so basically my life realization was even if I'm not making a ton of money as long as I'm able to pay the bills and I'm comfortable enough um, in terms of how much money I have saved up, then I will continue this route of just doing my own thing and being my own boss because uh, personally I feel like I'm accomplishing a lot um, of what I've set out to do by following this uh, kind of different path. I just want to say again, uh, the no student debt thing kind of helped out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to. Hold that down, right? 
Yeah, well, I want to explain how I got to that point. So I started working at a wildlife hospital um, as a volunteer at age 15. And as soon as I turned 16, was able to kind of work on the books. Um, before that, I had been dog walking since age seven. So I've always been a hustler. But anyway, oh, what? And chickens. I watch chick I'm actually watching chickens this week. Um, but anyway, <laughs> well, okay. Um, but my first real on the, on the books job was uh, working in a wildlife hospital, and that means basically caring for sick and injured animals. And I made $8 an hour, but I worked my butt off. And uh, that plus TAing um, and watching chickens and dogs, that all paid off, and I was able to graduate with zero debt. So work hard. Thank you. So washing chickens, like? Uh... No, I said washing cages. Okay, good. Here's something wrong. Okay. Sorry, Liam. Ten questions. So, um, I'm lo working local government. I'm in civil service, and uh, I mean, I have the lowest position in my office, uh, but it's a it's a pretty decent salary. It's not where I would want to be, but I mean, being protected by the the union, it, I have great benefits, uh, the pension, great health insurance. Um, and have the opportunity to move up. Uh, luckily, in my department, uh, there have been a lot of changes. We have a few retirements, and typically, it doesn't happen a lot in local government. It's the, it's the same people, and it's pretty stagnant unless someone leaves and someone new can either move up or come into the department. So, luckily, there has been some change, and uh, I should have the opportunity to to move up as long as I take the the necessary civil service exams to to get promoted. But yeah, I, I, I'm 26, I live at home and I'm not ashamed of it. So I, I, I've been saving up uh, pretty well, uh, just managing what I spend, but uh, yeah. So I think a career in civil service is almost as good as no student debt because from day one, you have health insurance, a retirement program, and a great job. I'm yeah. still covered by my mom, so. Big, <laughs> Sure. So I have plenty of student debt, and um, but it's actually I did the calculation is a little cheaper for me to buy a new social security number. So we're gonna fix it that way. Um, so going into business for yourself is a very tricky proposition. Uh, I liked the idea of you know setting my own hours and being my own boss, boss. Um, and but more importantly than that, I wanted to only work on projects that I could be proud of at the end of the day. And in the beginning, we only accepted work, you know, with uh, solar companies, with renewable energy projects. Um, but as time goes on, uh, you become, you realize that, you know, you got bills to pay and I have to, the jobs I was turning away before, you know, we're accepting more jobs now. Um, but vision versus career is really, you know, that's the, that's the oldest question. Right? That's really, that's the old one. Um, but so... In the seven years I've been doing my company, we've done about, we've developed about 1,200 um, solar projects, re residential, commercial, which is about 20 megawatts. And so we ran the calculations in Excel, and uh, we've offset about 40,000 tons of carbon just ba using the um, metric of if I, all that electricity was coming from a uh, fully efficient uh, clean running uh, gas turbine power plant. And so it sounds like a lot, 40,000 tons, but you know, I'm kind of at that point now where, you know what, I might have to, and I've been exploring that selling my business, divesting, and joining a bigger company where maybe I can do bigger work. Um, and so now that's, I'm at that, they're all kind of, the rest of the panel is kind of like at the beginning stages. I'm kind of, in that secondary stage where I'm looking to leapfrog into the next, uh, into the next um, phase. And that's, you know, it's, it's another dangerous or, you know, challenging transition. Um, but the, uh, the idea that um, you can join a team of like-minded people and carry the ball further. I kind of feel myself though, if I would have done that earlier on, it's too easy to just kind of go with the flow. I got a job, I work for a company, 
I don't want to lose my job. I'm just going to go along with the flow. And I just like me personally, I, I just I couldn't do that. But now that I have that uh, an acumen for this sort of uh, sustainability, I believe that I could really help a uh, a company move further. Thank you. And just so you know, I'm not meaning to put anybody on the spot here. Uh, so I'm a person who's probably had at least four different careers uh, during my time, and I'm still looking for advice so for the next one. So, Mike. So uh, I am lucky to be able to uh, earn a living doing what I'm doing. I'm just, I'm enrolled in a full-time graduate program, um, and I got a full tuition scholarship plus stipend, so I'm earning money as I'm studying, as a part of this teaching um, obligation that I have to the university. So if any of you are thinking about applying to grad school, I would definitely recommend you, before you apply, you have to look up advisors you'd be interested in working with. Fit is crucial when it comes to finding a graduate program that you will enjoy. And it's important that you enjoy it because it is absolutely a full-time job. So before you submit any application, look up advisors whose research excite you and make sure you contact them before you send in any applications. See if you can form a relationship with this person. See if they have room for you in your lab, in their lab, sorry. See if they have funding. See what other students think of them. Um, come in to meet them. Really try to get to know any future advisors as well as you can before committing to any program. Um, and then for masters, they're not normally funded, but if you're coming out of undergrad with a strong research idea, definitely apply for NSF. Um, Nat Geo has some great grants, uh, the Nat Geo Young Explorers grant. Um, and then if you're thinking about pursuing a PhD, which some students are able to get accepted straight out of undergrad, I would recommend going for it. PhDs are almost always funded. Um, you get a stipend for your teaching responsibilities. And if you find an advisor that you like, I would encourage you to go forward. Um. I'm also in graduate school, so my tale is very similar to Mai's. Uh, so as part of my graduate studies, I'm supported through my research, which is amazing, right? So I'm going to be able to take classes and do research, and I have a, I get a stipend, and I'm on full scholarship. This is really important that when you apply to schools that this is something that you are looking for, because at this point you've been funding yourself. And as a full-time job, it, you don't have time to make other money. It's, it's too much. You, and this, is your, the, this work is going to get you to your next place. So you want to go into a PhD after your master's, or you want to go into government, or you want to work for a nonprofit, whatever the case may be. Or you want to uh, go to law school, right? Uh, whatever it is, this is the most important thing that you're going to have done to date. And you want to be able to spend the most, as much time as you possibly can on it. And being funded is really crucial to achieving that goal. Um, but other than that, because otherwise my story is pretty verbatim of what Mai said, uh, I was also in undergrad able to find opportunities to work in labs over the summer, and they paid me for my time. So I was able to get lab experience, real lab experience, and support my summers. And I use that to help support my undergraduate degree. That was really great. <laughs> uh, I also did some internships, which I got scholarships for. Um, there are also, I know people don't really apply for them, and that's insane, but there are so many scholarships provided through sustainability and through SOMAS. I have gotten several of them, and I am grateful for the fact that they were there, and it's an amazing opportunity, and that helped me so much. Uh, I have received the Moat Scholarship, which I went down to Moat Marine Lab in Sarasota, Florida, and that supported me for the summer while I was working in an aquaculture facility. I got the Liblet Scholarship uh, for wastewater management, which was great. I, as in undergrad, I was like, you know, there's no real out opportunities to do outreach for students like to local schools, so I was like, well, I'm just gonna make one, right? Like, who's to stop me? I, 
here's a PowerPoint, here's like a game plan, let's find some teachers, let's do it. And for that work, I received a Liblet scholarship. They helped a lot. They were really great. There are opportunities out there, and you should apply for them. And that's, that, that's my addition onto what Mai said. <laughs> Hi. So my story is just a lot a bit different from everyone else's <laughs> that was here. Um, so Erica uh, and myself worked our butts off through school, but she was smart and paid for school while she was going to it. Um, I ate and drank a lot of my money, if not all of it, away, and I started adulting really hard right after college. So I did what we said we wanted to do, just move right off of Long Island and go get a job and get a cool apartment and have a nice car, and I did all of that. And then 2015 turned out to be the hardest, brokest year of my entire life. I did not graduate debt-free. I got uh, like three cars back to back and ended up having to pay for all of that. Um, rent costs a lot of money if you are not able to get someplace that you can get everything included, which I did. It is, it is quite the pain. So my advice coming out of college will definitely be, um, networking is a, a loaded word, but it is something that is very important. And what I've learned is through volunteering and networking, I was afforded really good jobs that although I spent a lot of the money, I really made great money. Um, prior to college um, and after. And um, I will say that, you know, my first year of school, my first year out of school, I was basically, you know, working two jobs, commuting about five hours a day. It was pretty insane. Um, I did it because I was commuting between the Hudson Valley and Long Island to work these two jobs. Uh, the salaries were worth it at the time, and then I totaled one of the cars driving home. So it, it was not worth the risk trying to make the money to live the life that I wanted to live, but I will say that um, it was definitely an, uh, an opportunity for me to really determine what I wanted. Was it like this huge paycheck right now, or was it are you going to work yourself up in this career? And there was something that my sister asked me before I graduated, because she knew I was making good money before college, and she said, would you be willing to take a $30,000 salary when you get out of college, I laughed, I laughed so hard when she said, it's like $30,000, like what are you talking about? It's ridiculous. And my first, first job out was $35,000 a year. This did not include medical and benefits. So when I did go to get medical, they took the $5,000 off and then took the money out of every paycheck for a, like a, another fee, right? So this is for your health insurance. So that left me in a pretty um, bad place, right? So um, now I will say I have a job that this organization is a part of Fight for 15. They give a great salary and, and medical package that can afford me to just work one job and afford where I live and the car and everything else now, but very much understand that depending on what your major is, there's a good chance that you're gonna come out, you're gonna make a very basic salary, and this is the time to work your butt off at this job and network. And not network like, what can you do for me? Network with true intentionality around figuring out what you can do for these people at the same time. It's, it has to be a win-win-win situation. Everyone needs to be winning in that networking opportunity. But you will get so, so many different grants, scholarships, jobs. All of my jobs have come from networking. Nothing has come from just applying online. Every single opportunity that I have has probably actually come through Heidi for the most part. Really, really, truly. I'm not even going to, you're probably going to be knocking on your door now. But very much a lot of it came from Heidi or her advice. Get business cards early. Get this stuff done while you have the time, while you may still be living at home. This is the time to do it. It's, it's, it, it was decisions that I had to make the hard way, and I give the advice away for free now. Work your butt off now, start off, and, and really try early to make smart decisions and, and save. Save. Um, so I started 
really understanding the importance of networking in probably my second to last, not second to last semester, um, second to last year here. Uh, so right like the year before I graduated and, and the year I was graduating. Um, Heidi would tell us, you know, go to this lecture, go, go to this, this conference. I'm like, I just came out of class and I worked all week. I don't want to take my evening and afternoon and go to any of these things. And then you would go, and it is like the leading people in your field and industry. I'm talking on Stony Brook's campus. They have the most amazing lecturers that come here. And there's no one there. I'm talking four people are in there, and I am like, I have you all to myself. This is crazy. So there are a lot of great things that happen on this campus. And one of the experiences in particular that I took on was going up to the Clearwater Festival as a part of, um, I wasn't able to take a class with Heidi. Uh, I ended up taking the class with um, uh, Fascinella, Mark Fascinella in the city. It was one or the other. Couldn't make it from the city back to Long Island quickly enough to take both. And in my volunteer experience, after volunteering for them for one weekend, I was offered a job. And the job, I wasn't even offered a job. I was asked to come up and speak with the new executive director just to have a conversation and hear my ideas. So I took the drive, why not? I'm not doing anything else. Went up there, had a conversation with him, didn't really know where it was going. He really seemed to like me, asked me to get in his car and you know, take a tour of the town. It's a place called Beacon, gorgeous place. Cool, on the way back to the office, he's like, so how would you like to join the team? I didn't even know I was having a job interview. <laughs> so I very quickly just said, sure, why not? I will tell everyone, research anywhere you're going to work before you work there. That is the number one advice I will give. Um, but definitely, as I said, opportunities come from nowhere. And right now what I'm learning um, with networking as my job as an organizer is a lot of the folks who I meet at first seemingly have either nothing in common with me or don't seem in my, my mind to be able to like offer me anything, right? And I remember one conversation in particular in my organizing work I had with an older gentleman. Five minutes in, I completely dismissed him. Two hours later, I was asking for a meeting that week with him. This man has given me so many volunteers out of the connections that he knows. He writes books, he is a humanist, he is such an awesome person. And I dismissed him immediately. So don't dismiss people. Definitely use the people in your program. Like, Erica and I graduated together. I share her posts or on Facebook. Like, it's a great opportunity to meet people and do it with intentionality. See what you can do for them before you see what, you, what they can do for you. Because quite frankly, giving, giving away will always bring you way more than you need. I guarantee you. Just give it all away. Give the advice away. Make the friends. Make the connections. It will come back to you tenfold, and you don't even know when it's going to come back to you, but it will. Now. I thought that was a key point because uh, your evidence of the success of that by what you've done and uh, people I think have to get that concept early on. Um, just one more thing to the panel. So this goes still on the choice issue. So uh, as an example, Liam is taking something that is really applying to your job in further certificate. Um, and Erica, you certainly have put your degree right to work in terms of that job. But I want to ask, um, for my and Emily, so you're on this continuing science uh, career. So one of the things that uh, I always think about when in, in make, making those choices, at one point it's whether you're going into sort of work business or academia. So you haven't made those choices yet, but uh, is that something that you think about along the way? That is something I absolutely think about along the way. And I'm asked, it seems, almost once a week what my future plans will be. <laughs> um, and I think, as of now, I've made the decision to go <clears throat> the academia route. Um, just based on role models I admire, um, how they decided to live their lives, what they're doing now. Um, and so, yeah, just emulate who you admire, I would say. Um, and I think it's still early on for me to say. I, I probably still haven't committed to this decision yet. But I'm enjoying teaching. I'm enjoying the research. And so I think that's what I want more of at this point. 
And I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I just think it's, you know, if you're in the audience, you're thinking about that on that, on that pathway. So. so, yeah, I'm definitely asked, if not once a week, more than that. And it's something I'm thinking about all the time. Uh, I'll be graduating in December, so people are like, oh, okay, well, so are you going to go on for your PhD? Are you applying anywhere? I'm like, hold up. <laughs> hold up, please, please. <laughs> I, this is what I know, and these are just my own, it, you have to kind of make boundaries for yourself and say that this is what you want to do or this is not what you want to do or you don't want to do it yet. You have to make those boundaries because it's so easy to get swept up in a way. I... I'm going to complete my master's. That's wonderful. I think that, and I didn't take a break from my bachelor's to my master's, so I think the next important step for me to do is to take a break from academia, get some work experience. I know many people from all the networking that I have done. Um, networking is really important if it was not made clear by any of us. <laughs> Doing things for other people will come back to you always, always. Um, so I think that through the connections that I've made, through my aspirations, I'm, I'm going to do something really exciting next year, and I don't know what it is, and that's okay. I'm very okay with this. I've applied for a couple of fellowships. Once I hear back from those, if I get accepted to, there's one in particular I really would like to do, if I get accepted to that, well, clearly that's going to be my path, and it's been made. That's great. And then in a year from then, I'll figure out what I'm doing again. But at that point, my experiences will be so different and so much more that it it will be at that time that I'll be thinking about my next future. Uh, if I don't get it, and that's perfectly fine too, I think things will fall into place. I, I have, I'll hear back in June, and at that point I'm going to start thinking about, well, would I like to work at the DEC? Would I like to study fisheries management or do fisheries management work in somewhere like Seattle? They have a completely different system. I would love to learn more about that. Um, thinking about looking at my CV and, under, and thinking about the things that I don't have yet, the experiences that I would need to get to achieve my goals. And so I'm always thinking about what's the next thing that would make me a better candidate for what I hope to do. Okay, thank you for sharing that about choices. I think uh, what you can hear, or what you did hear, was that this is a growing field. There's still plenty of opportunities. People are finding opportunities. They're making opportunities. Uh, so now we get to the point where uh, you get to ask some questions. So I would say raise your hand. Uh, hopefully you don't need a microphone or we have to run it up to you. You can address it to the entire panel or address it to a particular person uh, that you've heard something about and you want to ask about. That's okay with everybody? Okay. Questions? some things happening that may be happening that I don't think people are considering it. And it's important, like everyone was saying, about the networking. And as a student and as a graduate, you're going to have to try to um, separate yourself from the rest, uh, but whether becoming a lead GA, depending on what kind of field you want to be, which is easy. I don't know why everyone in this room is going to lead a uh, uh, associate. Um, but with the EPA, we're going to cut 30,000 jobs. These people are going to go and work for local governments. They're going to go work for industry. And I think a recent graduate is going to have a hard time stacking up against someone who has four years experience at the EPA. And so you, I mean, you're, if, if this comes to pass, which it looks like it might, uh, you're going to have to try to adapt and separate yourself from your classmates and from other people in the workforce. Uh, and that, that's something that I don't think anyone is talking about or considering yet. The idea about, all, all in New York State, we're a home rule state, and so that means all um, decisions are made at the local level. And so if the EPA is disbanded, 
Uh, we have the New York State PDC, who's really nervous um, the type of uh, enforcement. We also have, in California, of course, um, they have tougher laws than the EPA ever, which is the reason you part of catalytic converters because of California. Um, and so states and municipalities on their own will fortify their, um, their defenses against the Trump uh, administration. But also something that I think is in its infancy stage and we're seeing is sustainability as resistance. And so I think there are a lot of people who are not political, um, who are now seeing the direction that things are going. And you know what? Maybe I'm going to, maybe I'll stick it to them. Maybe I'm going to buy an electric car. You know, maybe, uh, and this is like a sentiment that you see building. And I think it's in its infancy stages. And hopefully, like this idea of sustainability as resistance, um, you know, takes off in the country. <coughs> So, I would, sorry, I would say that many of my colleagues, many of the people that I interact with in my research and otherwise are very, very unsure what the future holds. And I think it's, the phrasing there is important. It's not that, you know, many of the more old timer professors are like, well, the Reagan years, you know, this has happened before, you know, there's going to be a lot of negotiation that's going to occur. I, I, I think the best mode of action is just to act as though everything is status quo. And when things become official, that's when you modify. And other groups will come in and try and support the work that these groups are doing. Because to get freaked out about it now before anything's been finalized, I mean, Trump says a lot of things. A lot of things. <laughs> and um, giving them all so much gravity is dangerous because nothing is set yet. I, I'm not undermining the fact that we should be wary because we should and people are freaked out. But don't let that be what gets you down. Keep on and work towards your goals. And when other doors close, other doors will open, which sounds vague and kind of storybookish, but it is true. I don't know if that really answers your question because I don't think there's an answer, but perhaps that effectively answers a little bit. I like it. Don't panic. <clears throat> One of the great I themes. If you can live without clean air and without clean water, please raise your hand. You are all needed, especially if we don't have the EPA. The idea is civic engagement requires people, right? It requires folks to do their part, especially when the entities that have been protecting us aren't there. So just as we mentioned, if the EPA loses the 20,000 jobs, these people have to go 30,000. They have to go somewhere. They have to figure it out. They still have to pay bills. They'll still be here. And the idea is they're probably not just going to quit doing the work that they're doing. They're going to do it somewhere else. So yes, you want to diversify yourself um, from other students. That may include you know, taking something that's STEM related as well, just so you have a more diversified background but don't stray away from the environmental field because we all need kind of eco-warriors to really do this work on all different levels from government to in corporations. I know a cellular molecular biologist who works for a pharmaceutical company. She's one of my volunteers. She believes that we all need the right to good food, clean air, clean water, all of these you know, rights that we should have protected. So it's the idea that all of us here today are the ones who are doing the work to make sure that people have these rights protected. And just because one agency or entity isn't there or is being threatened doesn't mean the work doesn't still need to be done. It's probably more important now than ever. Yeah, and um, I mean, it, if it's your passion too, there's no way that you should stray from that. Um, I worked in the private sector before my government job. I was working for an environmental consulting firm, and um, that was that began in 2014. And 
at the time it was great. And it, because it was based on, like Sean said, the, the state-run uh, programs. At that time, the brown, state had a brownfields program that was like booming and development in the city was going you know, off the wall with the new apartment and uh, office buildings being constructed. And that required our environmental consulting firm to get involved to manage any contaminated soil that was being worked on. Um, and at the time I was working there, it was great. Uh, but from what I heard in the past, it was almost like a roller coaster with, uh, with the employment. People, there were times where it was bad and there were times where it was good. And luckily I was at a, a, a high point. But um, right now I'm actually glad I'm in the public sector. And uh, I, I think I would recommend it. If you're working in, I had experience in both fields. I think public is a little, uh, a little more secure, definitely more secure. Uh, Whereas the private, yeah, you may make a little more money, but just the job security is not there. So, thank you. Questions? Questions of our panel? Okay, so I'll ask another question. Uh, this is a really simple one, and anybody can jump on it. And if anybody else decides to have a question, raise your hand, and we'll go on you as well. Uh, we have a little bit of time left. Um, so this is kind of an easy one. It's uh, what's, the best, what's the best part of your day? <laughs> well, it goes to your choices, right? I'm, I'm doing something, and I'm sure there is a the worst part of your day too. So what's the best part of your day? So um, I feel like I'm loud enough. I feel like I'm loud enough. Um, so I work from home. <laughs> so the best part of my day is getting up when I want, unless there's some conference call, and not having to get dressed because no one's going to see me, and making breakfast slowly, and enjoying the birds outside of the balcony, and kind of making my own schedule. Um, I think that, coupled with the fact that when I do decide to start doing some form of work for the day, um, it's what I decided that I wanted to do. It's what I like doing. I get to call and talk to people. I get to make sure that folks who have never spoken to their local officials now have relationships with them and feel comfortable calling those offices and asking them questions that they have every right to ask because we pay a lot in taxes, right? Um, and empowering people in the community to feel as though they have the right to go and question their authoritarian figures in, in their lives, right? Um, and, and if you're going and you're working and you're paying all of these taxes, you should feel comfortable doing that. So I, I think, aside from the fact that I can do this all from my couch, um, being able to affect all these people, and you know, technology is amazing, doing it virtually, um, driving to some of the most beautiful places that I've ever seen in my life, just to go facilitate a meeting from community members who want to learn how they can be more engaged. Um, so definitely, Awesome working from home, but even more awesome because I'm doing what I'm really passionate about. Can I take that? So, the best part of my day, I, there's a couple of things that make my day really great. I love being in the field, being in the field, seeing the fish, seeing, you know, being, you know, putting out the net, deciding where to go, feeling like you've accomplished something. And after that, seeing where that data goes and the results and knowing that you that your results are going to go somewhere and they make sense with everything else, that's really rewarding. That's rewarding in the sense that your efforts make sense and they are going to be used to inform fisheries management and secure the livelihoods of millions of people um, and also sustain the fisheries themselves. I also really enjoy when I get a chance to sit down with students and tell them about the work I do and open their minds to something that they've never thought about before. Like, you go to the sushi restaurant, you never ask where the sushi came from, the fish that is on your plate. Like, oh, wow, that's a lot more complicated than I thought it was. And I understand my impact on this, and I understand my place in the system. I think that that is really rewarding as well. So for me, um, my days, as I'm sure all of yours are, are pretty packed. I teach uh, four days a week 
with class every day, and so I usually don't get home until 8 p.m. And at that point, I still have some assignments to do, some papers to read, and once I get through all those, my favorite part of the day is being able to kind of put that stuff aside and bring out what I'm there for, which is my own research project. Um, and that's something I really look forward to, um, even though it doesn't get done every day, but just being able to pick away at something that you're passionate at, um, passionate for, um, is really rewarding. Um, and as my role uh, as a teacher, I'm enjoying kind of trying to give these science students advice on how to become better writers because in Dr. Parkin's class that was an invaluable skill that I learned and is highly needed in the sciences. So I'm also drawing on that experience that I had with her to try to make their lives a little easier to try to help them along their way as well. Thank you. you have a comment on that? Yeah, you know, the best part of my day is when I'm driving around and I see a project that I designed or worked on and there it is built in real life. You know, I think that's something that, you know, from the business world you can experience. It's almost like a proud parent moment. Um, but I don't think you'll find that in like academia or like in government work. Um, and just to go, I feel like I should go back to the question before, you know, business is moving in a certain way. We're moving towards a carbon neutral economy. There's no question about it. Um, and I think that people who have developed a business acumen over the years understand this and they see what's happening now as an outlier. And I'm not going to uh, abandon my fuel efficiency vehicles for coal uh, cars because I know in four years we're going to be back to where we were in 2016. And I think that's something that in the hysteria of what's going on that gets lost, that business is slow moving, especially manufacturing and the transportation sector. It's slow moving and that's probably a good thing because it can be very difficult to steer that uh, backwards. Okay, Liam, the Oracle, comment on that? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, the best part of my day is, uh, like I said, we, I review site plans for commercial properties, and um, <clears throat> when we actually get to uh, do a little site design, uh, like Sean said, it, it is cool to review plans and see it actual, the construction come through, but we're pre-construction. We'll, uh, our office recently got a drone, which is pretty cool. We will fly it over sites that, that are we recently got applications for. We'll take a, a bird's eye view. Uh, we'll put it in our drawing program. We'll overlay the plans that were submitted and we get to like a, a real good visual of what a site may actually look like uh, through their proposal. And um, you know, we'll make modifications on that. We can, we'll influence the developers or architects or engineers, whoever's working on it, to, to make changes to it so that the entire site is in conformance with the town code. Uh, not going to impact any neighbors or or the community, and uh, I think the, the site design is the favorite part of my job, my day. So, the best part are the adventures, but on the day to day, I'm not always adventuring. So, um, like Shamika, like Sean, I work from home um, with the great company of my writing assistant, my Alaskan Malamute Fusa. <laughs> um, but the best part of my day is interacting with uh, readers or um, viewers of my uh, artwork or writing. Um, I often get uh, random emails from people and it really just like brightens your day when you know that you're, what you're doing is actually impacting people in some way. Um, don't read the Facebook comments on your stories that you've written because often it will be just a, <laughs> a complete mess of chaos. Um, good and bad. You know, you might set people off in a good way where they're just on a rant, but it's kind of crazy so I would avoid that. Um, but I've gotten great feedback, um, especially from my lectures. I've been talking at high schools. Um, I gave a talk here yesterday, and as I said, I'm going to be talking um, at different public places. But uh, just seeing, especially young people, their eyes light up, and when they learn about um, some kind of environmental problem, it's really cool to kind of be teaching people about what's, what's going on out there. So. Okay, I think we are um, out of time. So uh, first, I want to thank our panel, a hand for our panel. Thank you for taking the time to be here and uh, relay your experience. And thank you for everybody for coming along.
and come back to sustainable for refreshments.